uh, for those of you who are seeing me for the first time. Uh, my session that I'm presenting today is to deal with uh, what we call open source applications you should consider. Now, one of the key reasons why we decided to bring this session in is open source is actually playing a major part of our lives today. Um, sometimes you don't even know that you are using open source applications, but there are some critical applications that we feel can make a huge difference to one's bottom line, especially when you're running on tight budgets, need to save costs, and then open source and the vast array of open source applications that are available can actually assist you without uh, purchasing license-based applications. That's not to say that certain open source applications are not being licensed, because in many cases they are, especially if you want to get support. But uh, if you have a strong technical team, people that understand open source and are capable of understanding how to deal with community forums, um, you can quite often get away without purchasing support packs. Now, if I start to go through my um, pre presentation, uh, there are certain benefits of open source that people need to understand. The first one is it is highly secure. It is a wild untruth that's been broadcasted by some vendors for almost three decades now that open source is insecure, it's evil, it doesn't belong in our um, uh, monetary system. Um, and all sorts of other tags over the years have been added to open source and almost vilified open source, especially at the early stages of the uh, 21st century. Um, it is absolutely not true. The reason why it is so secure is because there is far greater scrutiny on the validity of the code that's being written because there are so many more eyes on the software code. And that is what people need to understand. Another aspect of open source is that it stimulates local technology engineering and it actually creates jobs. It is easy for uh, an organization to adopt an open source technology and even fork it into a solution that they want to customize and build on further that may be more practical and more designed for their local environment or the country where they reside without reinventing the entire wheel by building a solution from scratch. Another major benefit is the freedom from proprietary dictates. It means that you have much greater freedom in how you can apply the open source platform because you have access to the code. And if you have software developers, you can modify the application to actually suit your environment, but as long as you return that code back to the open source community. An interesting fact is today, almost all major vendors are embracing open source without really admitting it always. Um, if you look at AWS, um, Amazon Web Services, it's mostly built on open source. I mean, the hypervisor that I, they are using for the Amazon um, EC2 um, stack is actually XEN as the hypervisor. Uh, if you look at something like uh, Microsoft Edge, which is built on the Chromium project, it's open source. Um, some organizations that's paying hefty fees for example to Sophos uh, firewalls to establish VPNs, etc. The Sophos Connect VPN is in fact Open VPN, which is an open source project. Um, just to give you some idea of how wild, wildly 
uh, widely used open source has become within our environment and the major vendors are all embracing it because it accelerates them by customizing these solutions and bringing it, their own flavor of it to the market. So it is really in everyone's interest to understand that open source is actually an entrenched part of society today. But I want to highlight six really cool so open source applications. These are systems that uh, we are also using in-house. Um, the first one that I will briefly look at is LibreOffice. Um, LibreOffice is an extensive suite of applications, Office applications. Um, it really um, saves you licensing costs. It is free and open um, technology. It is um, making use of the open document format, which is in fact the standard in the world or supposed to be the standard. Um, and even in um, our own country, the open document format is in fact the official open document format that everyone should be applying, but it's not in practice always the case. Another component are we going to look at is the PFSense firewall. Sometimes I see how organizations um, pay hundreds of thousands of rands and sometimes even a couple of millions of rands to purchase um, proprietary based firewalls. Whereas by using an advanced firewall system such as the PFSense firewall, you can practically do exactly the same. And often I find it exceptionally secure. We have quite a large number of organizations in this country that is using the PFSense firewall and we've never had any issues in terms of breaches through those firewalls. Another uh, system that we're going to briefly look at is the check MK systems monitoring. Although it is provided as a um, And I know for a fact many people here are actually already using it. It is an open source platform that is even embraced by OpenText Net IQ in their SSPR, self service password um, system, is completely based on PW, the PWM open source project. Another component I'm going to look at is ASSP, which is the anti spam. Um, proxy, SMTP proxy service for email security, which I, we, we've been using now for um, basically 20 years already. And it is an exceptional open source email security gateway. It's not actually a gateway, it is more of a proxy service because it functions almost as an inline service listening to the communications. And then lastly, um, Something that uh, is of great benefit for organizations is a Jitsi Meet for video conferencing. It's a very easy, you can either make use of the cloud-based version of Jitsi, or you can build your own infrastructure within our own organization. Um, we are using extensive use of Jitsi in our own organization because of the ability to um, have various rooms every uh, uh, because of the remote working concept that we use in our own organization, every person has got their own meeting room. We can hop in and out of people's meeting rooms um, almost as if we are all sitting in the same office. Um, and it is a very effective platform um, uh, for uh, video conferencing that doesn't cost you anything at all. As long as you can host it, whether you want to host it in the cloud or even if you want to run it on premise and do it securely as well. So the first component we're going to look at 
is um, uh, LibreOffice. So let me quickly launch it up here. Quickly want to launch the different components. Now one of the components of LibreOffice is the LibreOffice Writer. And we have, at NetCB, we are using it extensively. Another component is the LibreOffice Calc. And the presentation you're seeing at the moment is being presented by LibreOffice um, Impress, which is the equivalent of PowerPoint. Now, the nice thing about LibreOffice is, first of all, if I go and I want to say, well, save as, you'll notice that it supports already saving in a host of different document formats. You can even save it in up to Windows 365 version of uh, Microsoft Office, if you need to, in the DocX format. Obviously, we standardize on ODT. Um, and it has even happened that we um, encountered a Microsoft Word document that Word itself didn't even want to open, but we managed to open it up in LibreOffice, fix up the document, and after that, Microsoft Word could read the document properly. Um, you will also know that it's important to know that the document formats of LibreOffice is much smaller than those on um, um, if you compare it to those on uh, Microsoft, um, I can quickly go here to one of my folders and just quickly go to the presentations folder um, just to show all. If you look at that, oh no, it's not going to show anything because it's filtering. But quite often we find it is half the size of a uh, Microsoft Word document. Another thing that we've done is to standardize our templates uh, within the organization because it's got a really powerful um, template mechanism. For example, uh, we use quite a, an advanced type of document. So if I quickly open up this particular document and you'll notice that in our organization we've um, templatize most of our work. So by just completing the document properties, the various fields will automatically get populated inside the document. So one can re build really advanced documents um, using LibreOffice without paying um, extensive license fees just to have an Office application. Um, especially in organizations where People quite often only need to review documents. Even if they need to review Microsoft Word documents, it's easy to open up those Microsoft Word documents inside LibreOffice. Um, the same goes for the, um, the Calc capability. Um, it can read Excel spreadsheets. Uh, it can read um, and save to Excel um, format as well. Uh, so there's no issue with regards to that. In fact, in our organization, uh, we, uh, uh, we sometimes use Microsoft Office for certain um, scenarios, um, uh, especially on the PowerPoint side. The PowerPoint is powerful, I must admit that. But uh, when you run standard type of presentations, um, the Impress is just as powerful um, to run certain um, types of presentations. It was very easy for us to create the template for Ned.Shared, for example, in LibreOffice and then save a version of that for Microsoft Office, for PowerPoint. And it was immediately accessible within PowerPoint. And people could also, if they wanted to use PowerPoint for their presentations, um, uh, use it with ease. So this is just in short. Um, get an understanding um, of LibreOffice. Um, we use uh, the style sheets quite extensively. You can set up standard styles for your organization that is applied. 
Um, I actually prefer the way they deal with their um, styles, um, especially if you came originally many years ago from a WordPerfect background, you'll find that styles are much closer in LibreOffice to the way WordPerfect dealt with it than the way Microsoft is actually dealing with styles. So the next one I quickly want to show you is um, the PFSense firewall capability. And I'm actually going to show you a part of our live firewall. I'm not going to be able to show you all the pieces of it. Let me just quickly see where is it running. Here we go. And as you can see, here is our live firewall running at the moment. You can see what throughput is running through it. And PeerSense has got all the different capabilities that you expect from a firewall. First of all, the interfaces. And, and the nice thing about the PeerSense firewall, it can also act as a network router, a software network router within your environment. If you add these multi-port adapters inside the hardware, it's very easy to place, have uh, a, a magnificent um, router, routing capabilities. Um, some of our customers are using it as routers um, with like 10 interfaces inside the firewall system, full VLAN support. Um, we are also, apart from standard firewall rules, um, you can have to set up NATs, aliases. We quite make use of aliases extensively because it makes firewall configuration far simpler. You can create alias groups, port groups, um, network groups, host groups, and um, instead of individually allowing access to specific um, devices on your network um, and make them available across different subnets on your network, you just add those devices to the different um, alias groups uh, within the system. As you can see, even I've got traffic shaping and we can run it with virtual IPs. You can even have scheduled configurations um, for on the firewall. Now, a uh, nice thing about PFSense is that it is extensible by with services. In our case, ours is running quite um, standard, but we also added some additional components, um, for example, like the Squid proxy server, uh, Squid reverse proxy server, um, uh, Snort, um, for example, for, for detection and analysis of packets that's coming into the system. Um, another area that uh, we use it for, first of all, it's also acting as our VPN for our users. Um, are we using the open VPN platform? And then uh, also IPsec um, that we use. For example, if I go to my IPsec monitoring page, I can see at the moment um, our on-premise data center is connected via a dual tunnel to our virtual private cloud sitting on the Amazon environment, as well as on the Azure platform. If I, for example, um, I bring up a uh, quickly access the server here, and you can see I am currently connected to my VPN. If I quickly show you that, I'm connected to my VPN, so I'm connected on our private network. I can even access on a private IP address. I can connect my group by server. And this is sitting on the Azure platform. And you can see um, where my uh, retained server I mentioned yesterday, I will actually bring it up if I type in the IP address, it's a private IP. This server is not exposed to the internet. And you can see, I can actually um, log on to my retained server if I quickly type it there. And this is all managed with our PFSense um, firewall, making this connectivity and maintaining this um, extension of our on-premise um, network in our data center to our data center sitting on the Azure platform, 
as well as our data center sitting on the AWS platform. And you can see I've managed to immediately authenticate to those networks. This is pretty powerful. And um, this firewall, we, and we, you can see we are using the community edition. If I zoom in slightly, you can see we are using the community edition in terms of this. The next item on the list is um, Check MK. Check MK is a very powerful platform for systems monitoring within your data center. Or if the systems are sitting in the cloud, it gives us real time information. I can see there's a couple of warning on some of our servers. Sometimes it may be a service that have, have been stopped. In this case, I know it was intentional. Um, sometimes it may warn us about one service that has got a type, uh, a specific critical state. If I quickly want to see what is going on on that service, I can quickly jump to that service and see everything is okay. Oh, and I see, okay, the lock rotate service um, is not running at the moment. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. So it gives us detailed information and it will send email alerts either via SMS or um, if a service go down that should not have go down, it will send out an alert immediately to the groups of people that are the owners of that system to inform them of the fact um, that this that service is down. Um, here we can see we're monitoring certain network connectivity. Uh, all those links are up at the moment. Um, I can also um, go and um, you can see that configuration is quite comprehensive. Your host configuration, the services configuration. It can basically monitor anything on your network infrastructure. Um, from the hardware level, um, it even logs onto, um, it has, it is, can be done agent based where you have an agent running on a service. It can, you can use SNMP to monitor services. You can use the IPMI interfaces to monitor the physical hardware. So if a fan, for example, is starting to provide trouble on your physical hardware. You can pick up on those alerts um, and prevent that system from actually overheating if you know that the speed of that fan has dropped below a certain speed. So, so it really gives you deep insight and real-time monitoring information of what is really going on within your physical and virtual infrastructure as well in, in, as in the cloud, because it will also monitor your services in the cloud on Azure, um, on the Google platform, um, Windows 365 access, um, and the various services on AWS. So it is a really very comprehensive system when it comes to systems monitoring. The next one is our Password management. Now, if I quickly jump back to that browser. First of all, um, we have customized the password management service completely for our own environment. Um, we've made changes to the code. We've updated certain components. Um, and we quite often package it with additional services um, um, I can, for example, go and if I quickly want to log in at this point in time, I'm just going to say I want to change my password. I'm not sure how long it is going to take, whether it's woken up. Am I still connected here? I had some internet issues earlier today. And there we go. So I'm quickly, and you can see it's, it can even interface it with um a capture uh it's not asking for stairs to be highlighted okay now bicycles just to verify i'm an actual human okay so they now say discovered i'm not a human 
and I'm actually going to log in um, to the system. I don't want to um, actually change my password now, so I'm just going to log in. You can see we use the forgotten password, username, activate account, and new user registration because we also allow customers to register on our directory services. It's possible that this server is a little bit busy at the moment. Oh, I actually typed my password incorrectly. Let me and it should allow me in now. It's quite a number of services it has. Uh, one of the services is, for example, for um, the help desk users um, to perform certain things. Um, I, we also use multi-factor authentication on this. Um, as you can see, if I click on my setup mobile app, it already tells me that um, it is enrolled and I can even check my code if I want to. Um, let's go back to the main page. As a help desk um, user, I can do, perform certain actions for um, users on the system. Um, for example, I'm going to quickly type in Keith's name here and quickly look at what password policy has been assigned. assigned. You can even check his password history when it was the last time he's changed his password. I can also, if he calls the help desk, the help desk can, for example, even verify him and say, I'm going to send you a token verification or an OTP um, to just verify that it is, in fact, you that's calling me and not someone that is faking Keith calling me at that point in time. So you can see with this password self-service system, it is pretty extensive from that perspective. The next system we can have a quick look at, and I see I only have got a few minutes left, um, is our ASSP system. Now the ASSP, as you can see, has got an extensive array of configuration mechanisms um, from um, spam control, whitelisting, um, uh, you can even say certain domains or IPs should never be processed, um, defining the local recipients, it can do LDAP verification whether these are actually valid users on your system, um, and uh, uh, validate the validation of the sender in terms of DKIM, um, DMARC, as well as SPF, um, using them in conjunction, um, so there's a host of uh, information. Um, it also makes use of what we call gray listing. It, if it has never seen a sender sending mail to you, it actually will damp the communication and tell it, try again later. Spammers seldom retry sending mail. So it will tell the other mail server, I can't talk to you right now. Try again a few minutes later. And if it's on the third attempt, it will actually allow it in because then it knows it is more legit than not being legit. Um, also, DNS and RBL validation, your IBL validation, spam att uh, attachment, um, virus protection scanner. Um, it also, an uh, interesting thing how ASSP works, it learns your communications behavior of the organization to whom you're sending to as well as the type of mails that you are receiving. And it builds up a language model to validate what type of content you are dealing with. If you're a marketing company, most spam filters may even flag everything as spam. But if it starts to understand that this is what you tend to do all the time, then the language model will identify this. This is actually valid mail content for your organization. So it is really a magnificent system 
in the way it works. It has got full SSL proxy and TLS support. Um, uh, and some of the tools that I like here is, is to look at the live SMTP in real time communication. Um, clearly, there's not much traffic going on through the system at the moment, but the minute an email flows through the system, if I look at um, the last um, couple of days, um, we've had 16,000 connections um, running through the system. Uh, you see there's, for example, an email communication that is just coming in, um, and I could e even immediately see uh, the destination of that email. So it's a very nice live view that you see on your actual SMTP communications and the different handshaking that is taking place during that process. The final component that I would like to show you is, and most of you probably already know this, and that is Jitsi Meet. Jitsi is a very powerful video conferencing platform. And as you can see, we host our own Jitsi server. Um, if I quickly can see, I've got some standard rooms that we have here. If I quickly jump into my personal room, and it, it immediately takes me into my personal room, and I'm now sitting right in my personal room. Anyone can now actually join my personal room on that URL. Um, because I've actually already authenticated to the session. Um, if I close the session, um, I can actually um, see if I can quickly log out here. No, I'm actually already inside. I've already authenticated the session. So it will keep until I close my browser, I will stay authenticated. We've got some various options. You can even do recordings on Jitsi. If you need, you can do a live stream from YouTube. Um, if you need to play videos, or you can even up, uh, share a video, it's got various noise suppression stuff. It now also have got what we call whiteboarding capabilities that's been added, backgrounds, etc. A uh, host of settings on the audio and videos, moderator settings. And this is free open source that you can use. So I hope I contributed and I gave you guys some um, options you can may want to look at in the future to improve your service delivery within your organization. Um, and you're welcome to talk to us if you need assistance uh, uh, in setting up um, any of these open source based applications. Uh, you are mo most welcome to contact us and we can see what we can do for you. Thank you very much.